Thank you very much. Can we get a microphone that works? Can you hear me back in the last row? It, it's imp there no. we go. Without the hum. No, if you make it louder, it gets a hum. There's a, there's no way. They, they often, uh, when I when I go to on these talks, they always say, "Do you need a PowerPoint? Do you need slides?" You need? I said, "No. All I need is water, and a, and a sound system that works. And sometimes I get the water, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's about it. All right. Yeah, that's a, that's better. Thank you. You're good." Um, I actually want to talk about something I call the pathology of wealth, or profit pathology. I've given it two names. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about mostly. Because that's the thing that's really oppressing us and much of the world today. And capitalist ideology, and it does have an ideology, has a, numerous popular myths attached to it what the anthropologists would call the Miranda and the Sacranda, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, scenarios that to be admired and the ones that are sacred, the stories that are sacred about its origin and its meaning. And the myth of capitalism has a lot of that. There's the myth of capitalism and social prosperity, that capitalism just brings social prosperity. Well, in fact, most of the world is capitalist and most of the world is poor. Don't talk about social prosperity to capitalist Nigeria. Don't talk about it to capitalist uh, Honduras or capitalist Indonesia or any number of places. There's the other myth about capitalism and individual success and ready access to wealth for those who have the gumption and the get-go. Capitalism and the free market self-regulation, you know, that. Uh, you know that one that I'll be talking a little, much more about that uh, later on. Capitalism brings international trade and peace. You notice all the peace we've got in capital. <laughs> I think I slept late one weekend and I missed the peace. <laughs> <laughs> and capitalism and its supposed symbiosis with democracy. And that's another thing I was going to talk about tonight because the title is Demo but. You know, I've, I've written about that one so long, I, I just uh, thought I would just meander around on some of these other subjects. Um, there's one, uh, there's one uh, common theme or myth when you launch into a critique of capitalism. It's, to, it's, uh, it's the one I call the mom and pop litany. Uh, it, it's the people who then celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit and say, well, two people, people start a little business and then it grows and they employ some other people. And, and it's usually said in this sentimental, nostalgic, sing-song way and all that. And I think those are good, actually. I've been accused on the internet. You know, you get accused of everything on the internet. I get a, I've been accused of, uh, uh, some guy wrote, Parenti is soft on small business. In fact, I am. I think small businesses are okay, you know. But we're not talking about small businesses tonight. We're talking about giant co corporations. As Lenin said about 100 years ago, um, you didn't know I was going to quote Lenin so early in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> he was in one of his more hyperbolic moments, too. He, sa he said, a million small businesses count for nothing. A few giant cartels count for everything. They are what laid down the law. They are the thing that shaped the face of the whole society and such. Well, the, so whenever I talk about capitalism, I'm not talking about mom and pop. But I'm talking about the big corporations, OK? <coughs> the free market core mythology to which both political parties in this country and just about all mainstream commentators are wedded to, argues in effect that, and here I'm kind of paraphrasing John Maynard Keynes, because he said this too about free market capitalism. The free market mythology, it argues that the most ruthless, selfish, opportunistic, greedy, calculating plunderers 
applying the most heartless measures in cold-blooded pursuit of corporate interests and wealth accumulation will produce the best results for all of us <laughs> through something called the invisible hand. And Keynes really, he mocked that too. He, I, I, he didn't have as many, as many adjectives of I, as I did, but he said, he said how do they think that, that the most wicked, I, I that was the word he used, the most wickedest people pursuing the most wickedest ends for the most wickedest means are going to produce these beautiful, wh what an interesting theory. Where the hell could they ever gotten it? Marx had, he had three words to sum up the entire process of, of, of corporate capitalism. It was accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And I like that quote because it 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 it, it talks. It ha he's recognizing. He doesn't really go into it. He avoids a psychology, and I usually do also. But I think it's time we have to treat some of these guys. Put them on the couch or something. <laughs> Since we can't put them on the guillotine, we have to. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> he uh, he um, he's giving this compulsive idea: accumulate. And what do you do after that? You accumulate, you accumulate. That's all they do, and that's all they need to do. Mindless, driven. It's a rational pathology. Are you still with me? Okay. The crimes and crises of corporate America are not, in my view, an irrational <coughs> departure from a rational system. I don't think Bernie Madoff is, is an aberration. It, quite the opposite. I think it's the converse. They are the rational outcomes of a basically irrational and amoral system. Um, the multinational dollar, uh, the multi-billion dollar government bailouts are themselves turned into an opportunity for pillage. Um, not, in other words, even even when they're they've been stealing and they're getting m money to compensate, they'll steal that money too. They'll steal. They'll steal. You know. They'll steal from the the, the contribution cup out there. And, uh, watch your property here. Um, not only does the state fail to regulate, it becomes itself a source of plunder, pulling vast sums from the federal money machine. We're exploited not only as workers, but as taxpayers and consumers. So if you work at, say, a no at a nonprofit and all that, that doesn't mean you're not exploited in this society. You're exploited as a citizen of the community. You're, you're exploited, especially as a taxpayer. Um, who was it? Bacon. Who, wh which one? Uh, you know, this is what happens when you get old. You shouldn't stray from your notes. But some noted commentator who, who prefers not to be mentioned right now, <laughs> he, sa he, he said, um, what the hell were we talking about? <laughs> You know, it's happening to all of you, too. I mean. <laughs> um, it's, it's a, the, oh, I remember now. The tax, that, that um, the public treasury is about the, the, the best investment that capitalists can make. You know, I mean, they'll spend a few million dollars on lobbying and some uh, campaign contributions, and then they'll get a contract for an oil reserve that's worth Twenty billion dollars. I mean, there's no there's no investment you can make in the private business world of a few million and come out with twenty billion. I mean, and you can go on plundering and ripping off from the from the public treasure. It's it's about the best investment you can make is to buy politicians and then to buy the resources that belong to the people, and and walk off with it. These reactionaries who scold us for running to the government for a handout, themselves run to the government for handouts. Why else would they have thousands of lobbyists? How many lobbyists do you have in Washington? <laughs> trying, to sc trying to scratch up, be quiet, what do you mean, some union or something, is that? <laughs> trying to scratch up, scratch up some money for you. How many lobbyists do you have? I don't see any hands going up hardly. Um, Corporate America yearly enjoys billions of dollars in subsidies, grants and aid, um, airwave licenses, loan guarantees, bailouts, tax breaks. Um, you can go on, export subsidies. 
<clears throat> with all the profits it pulls in every year, corporate America is on welfare, and, and they we got to get them off welfare. The essence of free market corporate capitalism is the transformation of living living nature into commodities and commodities into dead capital. So you take living nature and you get all these forms into and you get it, and then you finally accumulate these abstract forms of wealth which are going to be answered. I mean, they're really, all, all money and all treasury notes, all bonds, all stock, they're really sort of kind of promissory notes that, that there's a real world out there and value is going to keep getting created and that, and then this, this stuff I can cash it. I got these billions of dollars, you see. Um, but it's kind, of, it's kind of a depressive thing. It goes from living nature to this great amassing of dead capital. When left entirely on its own devices, capitalism foists its diseconomies and its toxicity upon the general public and upon the natural environment. And then it does an interesting thing. It eventually begins to devour itself. If the paladins of corporate America want to know what really threatens our way of life, it's their way of life. Their boundless way of pilfering the very community and environment that sustains them. And the more successful they are, the more deadly they become, like any, like any parasite. If it becomes too successful in its host, it does what? It, it kills the host and it's gonna be a catastrophe for the host, that's us, and for, and for the parasite too. There's a myth that prosperity is shared by us all. More for them means more for me. I've heard that. I've interviewed people who say, well, you know, the big company, if they create the jobs that I, you know, and then there's something for me. We hear that a rising tide lifts all boats. You've heard that one, right? I, I always say a rising tide can sink a lot of ships and, and, <laughs> and, and, and drown a lot of people. Um, still greater wealth for the very few it means less and less for the rest of us <clears throat> now what's been marvelous is this what's been marvelous with the Occupy movement is that this has been part of the protest this has actually been recognized that they actually come out and they start talking about the 1% and the 99% I think that's a beautiful division it's much better than those stupid quintile studies used to get. The top 20% make four times more or, or eight times more than the bottom. What does that mean? What the hell are you talking about? That's not wealth. You know who's in the top 20%? If you make 70, over seventy-five, eighty thousand $80,000, you're in the top 20%. You're, you're rich. They say the wealthiest top 20%, the wealthiest quintile, the wealthiest one-fifth make this. No, you got to look at the very, very, very tiny, that one, it's really not even 1%. It's really a fraction of 1%. 1% one per, one percent is, uh, you're talking about three and a half million people. There isn't that many in the super rich. It's, it's more like uh, uh, one-tenth of 1%. But let's say 1% would we'll, we'll, we'll give, I mean, because everybody in 1% is doing pretty well. Um, to finally get you know, these people out there in a mass popular movement talking about the great class divide that some of us have been talking about for 40 years and been trying to get people to recognize and finding that we're called extreme, we're called ideological, our colleagues in academia would frown at us or smirk and snicker and say, oh, that's a Marxist view of this or that, to finally see people out in the street just coming right out and saying 1% and 99% and seeing it getting picked up by commentators. Let me say, that's a big, that's a big ideological victory right there, a victory in words. <laughs> now, at this recession that the 1% is presiding over is not such a bad deal for the 1%. They don't mind recessions. Capitalism has never minded recessions. Labor unions are tamed and even broken during recessions. Labor unions have to make concessions. Labor unions have to often go without contracts and such. 
smaller business competitors are driven out or bought up for a tuppence, you know. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, Mar Mark said something about that. The, one capitalist will destroy many capitalists. You just, you, you just eat them up. You can just, uh, you can um, solidify your, your, your market, your field, and take over. Uh, not just labor unions are tamed and broken, but people are tamed and broken. People suddenly get worried. They line up for jobs they never thought they'd have to work for at wages they didn't know they were going to have to work for. At, and, and, and they have to get in there and work harder and harder for less and feel grateful that they got something going. And meanwhile, the profits stay pretty high for, for uh, uh, <clears throat> at least for a while. So I'll tell you what's bad, what's bad for capitalism, and that's capitalism. It's always in a crisis. Um, it's bad for us, but eventually it'll be bad for the capitalists. They have many opportunistic ways of taking advantage of all this. I'm just telling you right now with the recessions. Uh, but eventually, there's a limit to that kind of thing. Recession has another useful feature. The plutocracy would prefer a population that is hungry and impoverished and will settle for less and less, that, w that it must work harder for less. Um, the plutocracy doesn't mind unemployment. They could live with it, you know. The, the job providers, Bank of America, I was with a standing with my neighbor in a cafe. We were waiting in line. And I said, so how's your friends, the corporations? He said, hey, the corp listen, Mike, the corporations are job providers. Isn't that the term they're using? And this was like, I said, wait a minute. You know, yesterday I just heard, I just heard, I just heard on the radio yesterday, Bank of America laying off 30,000 people. That's, a, that's not the way a job provider should act, you know. It's pretty clear that they're doing what they want to do. And one of the things they don't want is they don't want the 99% to be educated, critically aware of their own interests, politically literate, have a strong sense of their own entitlement. That isn't the kind of population they want to deal with. Able to organize and articulate the issues. That isn't what they want. They want us demoralized, they want us demobilized, and they want us disinformed. <clears throat> this also better enables them to pursue global accumulation, such as imperialism and such. Recession is no, is no problem to imperialism. The empire is flourishing. I see people in some authors, a whole bunch of books are being, I wrote the book called The Face of Imperialism there, um, which takes to task these people who argue that um, it's all just for glory or it's all just for power. There are very real material interests involved in owning the whole world, you know, and controlling it. Um, and it's not just because we're overweening or we're inept or we're compulsive or we have a messianic uh, save the world complex or something. No, 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 no we don't have, you might have that, but they, these guys running the thing are much smarter than you and, and they know what they're doing. Um, Michael. That's my name. How about we're going to have a question period afterwards, okay? It's, it's uh, um, only in Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the empire is stronger than ever. Obama is an imperialist. He is committed now to aerial warfare and attacks on other countries. I, I, pity, I pity what is going to happen to Iran. There are commentators who've got it very mixed up, a few on RT that I saw not long ago. Oh, well, they'll never go into Iran. It's twice the size of Iraq. It's mountainous. It's got twice the population. They would need a million troops. No, they're not going to go in. The, the Air Force is all ready. They're going to do what they did to Yugoslavia They're going to and what, to Libya for the most part. They're going to destroy it from the air, hit every utility, hit every... Uh, uh, power station, hit every port, hit every transport uh, center, uh, and kill a lot of other people too. They, they've already, the U.S. Air Force has already announced that they have 10,000 targets in Iran. Um, and and, and joint, former Joint Chief of Staff, he was on the Joint Chief, he, he just had started on there, Admiral Tommy Mullen, 
who got up and said, and said, why are we bombing I Iran? The, the Navy's against it and the Army's against it. It's the Air Force that's, that's going to be their show, you see. So we're going to bomb Iran. There's 80 million people, all of them different, all of them human beings. What do we got to do bombing them? They, you know, he was head of the Joint Chief of Staff. They gave him a gold watch and they retired him. But, um, but that's where it's going. We have aerial warfare. We've got larger military budget than ever with Obama, larger. He keeps increasing it every year. And that's not because he's spineless. It's not because he's a weak sissy or a pussy or whatever else. It's because that's what he wants to do. That's what he's been pursuing. And, uh, new military bases, major bases in Kosovo uh, and Central Asia and other places. Iraq, they, they call the green zone bigger than Vatican City it is with its own, its own water resources and energy resources and the like. This empire feeds off the republic, and that's one of the points I make in, in the book, which is available right over there on that table. Um, and the economy suffers. Military spending is capital intensive, it's heavily subsidized, it creates per dollar many less jobs than transportation or teaching or health care or any number of other things that we might want, construction work and the like. Um, <clears throat> the plutocracy also does not want a social democracy with a viable public sector. Not only because of what I said before, they don't want people who are organized, alert and feeling entitled, self-entitled and so forth. But a not-for-profit not sector is a threat to capitalism. They have subsidized housing. They have some other things. They are able to negotiate. Uh, labor is able to, often to fight back, you see. And this is something that's, uh, uh, that's... This was something that bothered Ronald Reagan when he was doing cutbacks. He says, the problem is wages are still up, that wages are not down enough. We've got to get them down. A public sector where well, the social wage demonstrates the viability of public nonprofit services. You get them cheaper and you get them better. It deprives capital of accumulation opportunities. It provides market earnings to public budgets. That's a good one that we should all know about. Take utilities, for instance. We have PG&E here. It's a privately owned utility. We pay the highest rates in the United States. They make enormous profits, PG&E. Now, there are a lot of communities where the utilities, the gas and electric, is publicly owned by the municipality or the state. And, that, and, and your rates are lower because you don't have to spend all that other money on advertising on, on profits uh, for the shareholders and, all, and, and to compete against other people. And, um, and the earnings you make and the public utility goes into the public budget. It goes into the budget and it's used, which means it's easier on your taxes too. But that's just what, that's just what the pluto plutocrats don't like about that sort of thing, you see. They're not, they're, you're demonstrating that you can have production, you can have use, you can have human needs uh, dealt with, you can have money put into the tax ledgers, you can have private consumption and all that, and nobody, nobody in your little plutocratic gang is making a profit on it. And it's all cheaper and it's better and it's more reasonable for people. Lower costs and such. Um, someday we, we're going to see, we're going to see public ownership of our utilities here, let us hope. Um, <clears throat> Um, there's a function, the function of the capitalist state is of course to make, make society, make the economy, make the, the polity safe for this whole accumulation process, uh, to keep people in line, to circumscribe and, and, and diminish the demands of the working populace. But there's another function of the capitalist state, I argue, it, it's seldom mentioned um, it consists of preventing the capitalist system from devouring itself, to protect capitalism from the capitalists, 
to restrain the self-devouring beast because that's what it is. It eats everything in sight, including its own feet and its own tail and then its own, own body, you see. An economy dedicated to speed-ups and wage cuts to making workers produce more and more for less and less is always in danger of a crash. To maximize profits, wages must be kept down. But someone has to buy the goods and services being produced. For that, wages must be kept up, or you've got to be paying out some wages. There's a chronic tendency, as we're seeing today, toward overproduction of private sector goods and services and underconsumption of necessities by the working populace. So what happens in a situation like this is that recessions destabilizations, uh, imbalances in it are the chronic condition. It's not a crisis. Th that's the natural condition of capitalism. Crises is the normal condition. Hardly three years after the Constitutional Convention ended in September of 1797 in Philadelphia, came the recession of 1790. The country under the new constitution was, was, wasn't even three years old, okay? And they had a recession. There was the panic of 1797. There was the recession of 1802 that went on to 1804. There was the depression of 1807 to 1810. There was about 20 more of these crises, panics, recessions in the 19th century, most notably the Long Depression of 1873 that went on uh, to, to 1879, almost to 1880. 1890, four recessions in the 1890s, 1890, 93, 96. 1899, the big one. You know, that was a very troublesome. And what did we need? I tell you what we need. Our buddy, our boy, Teddy Roosevelt, told us. He said, this nation needs a war, any war. <laughs> yeah, pick it up out of this, you see. Get it going. And that's, in that, that's exactly what they did. They picked a war, picked a fight with Spain, which was weak and had all these nice, ripe, low-hanging colonies, which the U.S. just ripped off and took. Go into the 20th century, three recessions in the 1920s. I didn't know about that. All I heard about the 1920s, it was the jazz A's, Charleston, Charleston, remember that? And everybody was having fun. Um, then came the Great Crash, 1929, a Great Re Depression, 29 to 41, pulled out of it by a thing called World War II, and so forth, 49, 49 no, did I say 29 to 41, then 49, 53, 58, and you can go on a number of others. There was the one in Reagan's first term, remember? That was a serious one. Um, so in other words, that's the normal condition of an unregulated capitalism. Crises, and, 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 and we feel it. We're the ones who, who get the, the, the blows, who have to suffer the blows for, the, for this kind of thing. And also, even at the individual level, Living in this kind of society, no Americans, except for the super rich 1%, no Americans have complete economic security. The rest of us are never really secure. Investments can go wrong, job loss, illnesses, your 401k becomes a 101k. <laughs> All sorts of things like that happen. One out of three Americans over 65 have no teeth. There's no dental insurance. It's not covered by Medicare, I don't think, is it? There's no, no Medicare. And that explains that statistic then. Isn't that amazing? Under capitalism, we live in our personal recessions, our personal panics and crises. One of two Americans now are below or barely above the poverty level. You know, the fact that you are, are you know, $500 above the poverty level doesn't mean you're okay. I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible. Um, the poverty level is determined by, by simply a, a sketch that was set out back in the 40s as to what a family of four, 
how much it would cost to live in an affordable house and how much for groceries and how much for this and this. And they put this together. You know what they forgot? They never put it in? Because in those days, not that many people had it. I remember, too. Automobiles. I mean, we, we didn't have automobiles, especially living in New York City. You, you didn't have an automobile. And people say, oh, you live out there? You'll need a car, which was like you'd have to buy, you know, a, a, whole, a whole airplane or something. Uh, it was beyond our means. A car is an expensive item. I don't know if you've noticed. The upkeep, the payments, the insurance, the servicing, the gasoline, and the like. That's not even estimated in the poverty level. Um, also, there was a time when inflation wasn't really accurately. I hesitate on this one because I think they've worked that out now. But you know that the inflation for durable goods was really not as drastic as the inflation for single-use goods. In other words, much of, much of the inflation was food and rent and, and, um, and that kind of sort of thing, medical care and that sort of thing. And, um, and, but they would, they would, they would they, uh, I hate to go into you know, spread it out on all the possible items that people could buy, and that sort of lessened it. And that, and, but you know, how many refrigerators did a, does a poor person buy in a year? Um, and the inflation on refrigerators was less than that. So, so that there was a distorting downward, uh, a downward effect on, on the inflation. But inflation was, was eating up a lot more than was, than was reported. And, and these thing of cars, I saw a film, a documentary of this medical team that's been going around in America and going to communities and inviting people to come if they had treatable you know, illnesses, just problems. And people would start showing up, and they'd be they could they could treat a hundred people an afternoon, let's say, and there'd be three hundred people would show up. You know, it, it was the saddest thing to look at the end of the day. The guy come out and say, "Well, we, we're closed. We can't take any more. Come back tomorrow if you can." And you could see these people walking off. And who were they? Uh, one of the doctors said, "They're the working poor. Most of these people have jobs." And I look at the film, and I'm watching them, and they're going out. And where are they going? They're going off into their par parking lots. They got enough, they have to come up with enough money for the cars. That's where their money's going. It's going in cars and they can't pay for a doctor. So, so I'm saying, what I'm saying here, I'm taking too long to say it, but the poverty level really should be a lot higher. Uh, uh, you know, if, in other words, what is affordable, what we really need for a family of four is not down here, but up here. And that would really increase the number of people who are living, <clears throat> who are living in debt? Uh, I mean, who are living in poverty. Um, now let's let's talk about the 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 addicts and the and the and the psychotics who are in charge of this world in this country. <laughs> um, another another disposable resource is the environment itself, as you know. Um, the money addicts, they grab more and more for themselves, more than can be spent. Many of these people have more money than they could spend in a thousand lifetimes. I mean, even if they, you know, lit every, every uh, whatever, cigar with a thousand dollar bill, they, there's just no way they could, they could spend all that they have. They can't, even, they can't even figure out sometimes how much they got. More than can be spent they're driven by what begins to resemble, though, an obsessional pathology, a monomania that blocks out every other human consideration. They're more wedded to their wealth than to the earth upon which they live. They're more concerned about the fate of their fortunes than about the fate of humanity. They don't see the disaster looming ahead, or if they do, they don't seem to care. There was a New Yorker cartoon. In fact, I reproduced it in uh, the ninth edition of Democracy for the Few, which I don't have here because the, the book costs too much. Um, but it was a great cartoon. It shows a guy at a lectern like this at a co business conference table, and there are people sitting along there, and there's a big chart in the back with the arrows going up, you know. And so it's obviously he's making a business report, and he, a stockholder report, and he's saying, and so, while the end of the world scenario will be rife with unimaginable horrors, 
We believe that the pre-end period will be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. You see. And that's, and that's not such a joke. You know, years ago, I used to say, these idiot plutocrats, they're not going to recognize the dangers of um, global warming until the North Pole begins to melt. That was the term I used, North Pole. Well, now we know the Arctic is melting. I mean, it's just going apart. And you know what? They still don't. They, they, there are now companies that are emerging to show you how you can make money on global warming. <laughs> what are the new angles or approaches. And they're delirious about two happy deliriously happy about two new developments. One is with the melting of the Arctic, this opens up access to oil reserves. Yeah. You could get them, you know, you could have done it with it right through the you can drill right through ice and get to that oil. But the trouble is the Arctic it's just ice. It's not it's not like the Antarctic. It's not grand and it, it moves, so that would snap your pipelines and it's just impossible to do. But now they're going to be able to drill directly to the oil. And the other delightful thing is a Northwest Passage. Yeah, it's open now. We'll be able to go right across. You don't have to come down all the way down to Panama, all the way down around the Cape or anything like that. I mean, the dream that's older than Lewis and Clark, a Northwest Passage, and we're going to go do this, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, wow, wow, you know, I'm missing something here. I, I, or, and what are they going to drill for? They're going to drill for the same fossil fuel that's already melting the Arctic. And, 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 uh, and as you know, that fresh water, the tons of, they say in one day there's enough uh, fresh water, it melts off the glaciers to provide drinking water for New York for a year or something. Um, but that water is of such immense way uh, uh, immense amounts that it is uh, slowing the Gulf Stream, which is already going slower and slower. That Gulf Stream that's coming up is the only thing that's keeping Europe as a temperate zone. And these extra cold winters that Europe is getting, and in fact Midwest and the Northeast and the US, uh, and, and I think the Gulf Stream, we have the Japanese Gulf Stream, don't we? We don't call it the Gulf. What do we call it? I think, I, Jap Japanese Current, right. Um, that too is slowing down. So we, th with global warming, we may all end up freezing to death. It's kind of ironic, but um, uh, <clears throat> so what are the alternatives? I'm going to try to wrap up here. Um, the altern the alternatives to wealth pathology and to corporate transnational capitalism, socialism. Well, isn't socialism a dream in theory and a nightmare in practice? That's my own phrasing, you like that? And then I answer it, I say, no. <laughs> I need some water because here's where we get to the sensible part of this talk. Instead of treating this question as a grand clash between two ideologies of socialism versus capitalism, communism versus democracy, you know, so look at the actual practices and realities that be are before your very eyes. I just We just already went through one about public utilities versus private utility. One is socialistic. It's not for profit. It's publicly owned. It gives better service at lower rates. You don't, you, don't find, you don't find the criminal activities you have with PG&E. They got $45 million that they were supposed to use for repairs and they spent it on a, on, a, on a statewide referendum to prevent any kind of public ownership of utilities. Remember that? And then the people in San Bruno remember it even better than we do, including those who lost eight, eight Eight people died. That was money that was supposed to go to those repairs, you see. So there's, there's, pri there's your private capitalism at work. And under socialism, if it's properly regulated, they would have fixed those pipes. Look at the actual practices. I had students at uh, SUNY when I taught years ago, State University of New York, SUNY. Uh, I taught in Albany and I taught at Stony Brook. This was at Stony Brook, I remember. Student got up and says, Socialism, 
I can't imagine it. How would it even work? I said, well, you're sitting in it. You're sitting right in it. You're, you're sitting in socialism right now. On that, that chair that you got your butt on is a socialist chair. The teacher you're talking to is definitely a socialist. <laughs> The building, everything. State University of New York is a socialist institution. It's publicly owned, and you're, you're able to go here because it's publicly owned, and you can afford it. This is before the days when they, uh, you know, they're, they're, pri they're privatizing, incrementally privatizing all of the public institutions. And what about it? The, 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 the teaching was as good as any private. In fact, on Long Island, I compared it to a, a few other Long Island private schools, uh, the, the school of SUNY was, was much better than all that. I'm not going to name names, but that's definitely it. And I said, oh, oh, well, oh, it feels all right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay, you got qualified teachers. We had better students, too, than the private schools did. Yeah, but, but what about socialism in the Soviet Union and China? A failure. Well, don't forget, in both cases, those were siege socialisms, is what I call it in a book I wrote called Black Shirts and Reds. That is a, a socialism that's trying to develop and is denied a normal, a normal environment in which to develop. It is constantly under siege. It's constantly under attack, constantly being invaded. Um, and anyway, it did work to some measure. In both China and the Soviet Union, Hundreds of millions of people in both of these countries went from abject poverty and misery to having sufficient food and housing and medical care and good education. A historical accomplishment, a historical accomplishment never seen before or since in history. For whatever other crimes, mistakes, whatever else was done. Compare China with India. They're always comparing China with India. You want to know one of the differences between China and India? In India, there's mass misery. About 70% of the population still lives under a brutal, feudal system. And China had 40 years of communism. And in those 40 years, they had 40 years of literacy, 40 years of co-op farming, infrastructure development and the like, and 40 years of eliminating and getting rid of that feudal class, which they did. Um, I was reading an account of an Indian village where the women share and rotate menstrual rags. I'm giving you a little too much information here, I know. Uh, that's how, I mean, they wash it out, uh, what, what passes for, for clean water in the village. And, and it's lent, the, you, lend it, you lend it to another female member of the family. I mean, how poor is poor? Of course, there's a stratum in India during that period when you had a sort of social democracy going, people got educations and all that, and they've developed. But that's, a, that's still a minority of the country. So there's, there is historically the difference there. Um, of course, now, with more consumer prosperity in both China and Russia, you have more wealth for a select few and more poverty for uh, millions. But still, it's not the worst of it. I mean, I don't want to idealize China because there are real problems, real things not, not good, like corruptions. And I mean, there are like 100 demonstrations a, a day throughout China because of uh, all sorts of problems and malfeasance and such. But um, I just ask this. Do we really want certain essential services run by people whose primary interest is the accumulation of profit? Medical care. Do we really want rich hospitals, rich insurance companies, rich HMOs, m and millions without coverage, millions who go broke, to pay, to pay medical bills, millions delaying treatment or delaying retirement because they can't afford to pay. In countries like France, Norway, Finland, socialized medicine, you get better care, lower cost to society. They spend less per capita in these countries, and yet they get better care because there's no profiteering and there's no money being spent marketing and all, and all the other stuff. 
and you have happier doctors and happier other personnel and including patients. No one goes without. In this country, it's a joke. I just had, a, I just had a, an operation uh, three weeks ago. And you know, you walk in, you know what the first thing you do? I'm writing an article on it now. It's pretty funny. You really don't, you really don't want to call your doctor. You want to call your lawyer. Yeah. You got all these pages here about trans and this and if you that and permission to and and I hereby grant there was one there was one line in there that terrorized me it said I hereby grant the operative uh, crew to remove any member of my body I said M member any <laughs> any member of my body as they so determined needs to be removed I said whoa whoa what am I getting into here <laughs> It's lawyers before doctors, you know. Okay. <clears throat> Transportation. That's socialist in Europe, and the trains are better in Europe than in the U.S. Amtrak is better when it's publicly owned. When, when it, goes, it gets thrown back and the government has to pick it up again, they put in new rails, they put in new trains and all that, and then they start floating stock and the stock gets bought and the, and the private owners start milking that Amtrak all over again. They don't do anything to it and we have to fork it up again. Capitalism works if it works at all because it always has socialism to bail it out and, and to subsidize it. <laughs> The trucking industry gets the feds to build the highways. Even corporations get subsidies from the government. I already went through that. I listed a lot of the things. What about your, just local communities, your fire department? There still are in America any number of fire departments that are private volunteer. They're just not as good, not as well trained, equipped, or available. Public schools are better than charter schools unless their budgets are slashed and slashed and and all that. That's the way, that, that's the way they, they undermine public sector services is by defunding them and then saying, oh, you see, that doesn't work, that, that's not good. Not all things need to be socialized. In Cuba, they are now doing small service businesses, which are, I think, a good. They've had one, they've had one small service business. It's been privatized. It's for years. Nobody knows about it, but it, it exists there. And the government did not dare to go in and say, this has, to be public, uh, the gov this has to be publicly owned. You know what the business was? It was women's hair. You don't mess with women's hair. Every <laughs> Remember this. Women's hair is a work in progress. It's always something, there's always something they're doing, you know. And, 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 the, and, the, and, and, the, and the communist government backed off and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to let that be privatized, okay. <laughs> and so they got these little beautician shops, you know, women having their hair done. <laughs> Worker cooperatives, we have right here in Berkeley, the cheese board, get high quality salads an excellent pizza. I don't even like pizza, even though I was raised on it. I, don't like, I love the cheese board pizza. Um, and workers are sharing, at the, the workers at the cheese board share in the earnings. Now you notice I didn't say share in the profits, I said share in the earnings, because they earned it. Profits are what you get when not working. When not working, that's what profit is. I've had that problem. Pe people come up, some, somebody come up and say to you, well, don't you make profits on your book? I said, no, no, I wrote the book, you jackass. I wrote the book. <laughs> I sat. <laughs> and the editors who go over it and insert all their mistakes, they, they're working on the book. I mean, you can't help the poor dears. They're very confused. And, uh, <laughs> And the distributors and the advertisers and the, and the printers who print the book and, and all, they're all, in, they're all adding value to this product and making it saleable, you see. So none of them are making profits on it. The profits go to the owner of the publishing house. When I was at St. Martin's, the owner was, was Harold McMillan, the McMillan book family. They owned, they owned St. Martin's Press, one of the biggest presses in America. One of my first books there, uh, and, and, and you know who Harold Macmillan was? He was Prime Minister of England. I saw him being interviewed years ago on, uh, oh, I forget, one of those talk shows, and the guy asked him, he said, well, how do you manage now that you are no longer in politics and all? And he said, uh, he said well, the family has a little publishing house that does quite well. <laughs> and he sniffed like that, and I'm sitting there and going, who is son of a bitch? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, are we having fun yet? Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm gonna, there's housing co-ops. There are consumer co-ops. Gara Perovitz has just done a new book on co-ops in America. There apparently are quite a few of these things going on. So what we're facing right now, and they're facing it right down the block here with the, with the Occupy uh, Oakland and such, is that when the people um, are faced with the rollback of their, of their uh, material interests, their economic democracy, whatever little shreds of it they have, is being further destroyed and such, they then turn to their political democracy and try to mobilize that as a way to protect their economic democracy. Then the struggle by the plutocracy expands from the, from the economic democracy to political democracy, and they start to try to repress our political rights, which is what they're doing as we talk right now. Then the struggle is directed at the political things. Repression of most peaceful demonstrations, attacks, mass arrests. We see every Occupy movement has been, has been smashed and, and uh, bullied by, um, <clears throat> by the police. The police themselves are um, militarized. They, they come at you with, uh, with you know, uh, percussion grenades and, and um, mace and pepper sprays and billy clubs and um, tear gas canisters that are shot and can kill people. Uh, uh, mace? I, may, I, may, I said mace. 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 Oh, oh, the tasers. Uh, yeah, well, and they've got all sorts of other things. What I like is they, 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 these, 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 these SOBs, you know, some of them won't get off their ass uh, if it's coffee and donut time to go answer a real call. But they're all up there and they're all, they're all marching together shoulder to shoulder and got a guy behind them and he's, they've all been trained, they all get choreographed for this and, they, and they're getting off on this, being able to beat up these, these uh, y young people sitting there, not so young. Um, and they're suppressing the vote, they dominate the airwaves. They um, now just passed autocratic legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act, you know, which, which gives the president um, <clears throat> power to incarcerate and hold without charges or trial or evidence anybody he so wishes, citizen or not. And when Carl Levin, who supposedly is a liberal senator from Michigan, turned around and said, well, we did getting a little uncomfortable about, you know, didn't want to lose his credentials. We did say to President Obama, we can take that phrase out. He said, no, no, leave it in. He's, the guy is full of deception. Uh, um, and um, so what is to be done? First and foremost, ideological struggle. We really have to understand something that the reactionaries and the Republicans and Fox News has known and is, or operates with, which is that ideas count images count, but they also need to be in an ideological scenario. Uh, they have to um, get through to people, give them an explanation as to why these things are happening, not just to denounce them, but to understand why it's happening, whose interests, cui bono, who benefits from it, how do we pay for it, what our interests are. We have to also struggle in the workplace, class struggle, create new workplaces, that's what I meant, that's why I mentioned the co-ops and such, alternative institutions, but publicize the co-op. When you make, when you build a co-op, publicize it, give the public a reason why this is the, <coughs> explain to them why it's different than if this thing was owned by Tip Top Bread or Wonder Bread or somebody like that. First of all, it'd be, it's better quality because the other guys are not interested in making bread, they're interested in making a profit. So, theory and practice. The Occupy movement has been smashed by police action, but that's only one aspect. That's the camping of it. Right now, today, in the next few days, I think the Occupy movement throughout New England, all sorts of Occupy, including Occupy Wall Street in New York, are meeting and, they, and they're having a big conference. They're having panels and, and teachings. And um, 
and this is part of the way to raise consciousness, to get people to get people to think differently, think outside that that uh, horrible suffocating box that they try to put us in. I remember years ago during the Vietnam period, there was there was no shortage of people who would sit on their butts and they'd say, "You're not. How are you going to stop the Vietnam War by just demonstrate by demonstrating?" And and or they'd say, "How are you going to stop the Vietnam War by?" handing in your draft card, or burning it, or, or getting arrested, or writing to Congress. I did all those things, by the way. Um, how do you, uh, well, you know, what happened, we did turn opinion around. I mean, of course, the durability of the war and the, the courageous persistence of the Vietnamese people were the major factor. But the point is, it did reach a point where the US military wasn't fighting. Units were refusing to make contact with the enemy. They'd be sent down, sent down the road to go fight, and they'd all sit down on the side of the road and toke up, you know, <laughs> and pass around. Or they would frag their their uh, their uh, officers if the officer got too persistent and all that. And it reached a point where it was getting shaky. Where suddenly the that there was a feeling at the very top that we might not be able to elicit the empowering responses that sustain our rule. And if you don't give them your empowering response, then they become powerless, you see. So democratic struggle can help us make gains, small gains and such. It can be our last line of defense, and but at the same time it can bring victories when things look most hopeless. Thank you very much. Thank you.